don't know. I don't own it. I own the other. I just rent it. I'm trying to butter her up so I can buy it. <clears throat> All right. We'll get started tonight. I've uh, been told it's already past seven, so it's time to start. Uh, just having a good time fellowshipping and uh, looking forward to our service tonight. And I uh, pray that you've been praying for it today and this week. And I pray that you've been praying uh, for our church this week through our 31 days of prayer. And uh, I want to say this, I appreciate so much Miss Nicole. She does a great job with our <coughs> Facebook accounts. If you see our church face, Facebook page, she's always putting very encouraging things on there. She's done a good job through these 31 days of prayer, um, you know, reminding everybody to pray and putting different verses and things on there to, to do that. And I appreciate her doing that so very much. But uh I, I'm so thankful for a church that prays, amen, what a wonderful thing that is, and and I, we've seen the benefit of it, seeing how God has moved through our church because of prayer, and uh, we ask, ask you to continue to pray through the rest of this week, and we'll add another step to that this coming Sunday, so looking forward to that. Before we get to, into our study tonight, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and again, let me say good to see all of you out here tonight. Thank you so much for coming, being faithful to come to the house of the Lord. Uh, for those that are listening online, it may be on, on Facebook, we appreciate you guys tuning in as well, but um, it's just really a, a highlight of my week to get to come in here and fellowship with you all each Wednesday night, and I appreciate you coming, appreciate you uh, not letting fear run your life, and um, I, I just appreciate the Lord today. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. If we have any special prayer requests tonight? Beth Johnson. Pray for Miss Anna's family. The, the fellow that got burnt, yeah, Mr. Mike White, let's uh, remember him. And please be much in prayer for um, the ones we have dealing with the virus. Miss Nikki, pray for her. She's doing okay. Uh, not Symptoms are fairly mild. <laughs> But remember her when you pray. Also remember the Caldwell family, uh, Mr. R Brother Ralph's wife, Kim. She's actually at Tanner Hospital right now. She started receiving her uh, new treatment this afternoon. She's getting plasma. It's a new uh, antibody treatment that they're using, so y'all pray for her. Um, she does have some signs of, of um, pneumonia, but uh, pray for her. She's got a lot of other little underlying issues that's making it more difficult for her as well. I did talk to Mr. Gwen Caldwell to, uh, this week. He seemed to be doing much better. They, he said, we still need your prayers, but uh, doing better, just really tired, didn't have a whole lot of strength, but his wife has been cleared to go back to work on Monday, so they are doing, doing as well as can be expected. <coughs> Excuse me. Any others? Pray for that family, the Estes family from Brendan. Pray for them. Remember our schools. Um, remember schools here in Heard County and also those will be starting back coming up. Remember our teachers. Remember our president and our nation. Uh, continue to pray for them. Remember Brother Joel's family that's dealing with the virus. His brothers have been having a pretty long battle with it. Any others tonight? All right. We're going to ask the Lord to, to be with our Bible study tonight, to lead us and to guide us, give us wisdom, understanding, and uh, may this be a, 
a help to us. May it help us to <clears throat> stand and contend for the faith. Help it help us to um, have a good spirit in the way we interact with people and uh, the way that God wants us to do that. We're going to ask him all these prayer requests tonight. Anything else before we go to the Lord in prayer? All right. If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Yes. I guess I, um, I can't get him up. Bert Hall, let's remember that one. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Let's remember him. All right. None other than that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Ask him to touch his service. Dear Lord, we come to you tonight as humbly as we know how. Father, we thank you for the another opportunity to be in your house. God, it's so good to gather with your people, God, to... Lord, fellowship one with another, Lord, to worship you, Lord, and have you instruct us in your word tonight, God. Lord, before we even start tonight, Lord, we want to ask you to forgive us, Lord, where we fail you. God, we ask you to just uh, wash us, Lord, sanctify us, Lord, just clean us up on the inside and on the outside, Lord, that we might receive the word that you send forth to us tonight, God, that it would change us, Lord, that it would transform us, God, that it would help us, Lord, to to be better examples, Lord, of what a Christian should be. Lord, that it would help us be a better witness, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy in a lost and a dying world. God, I just pray that you just uh, lead God and direct us tonight. God, you've heard every request that's been made tonight. There's so many that's dealing with this virus, but, Lord, we still know and we fully agree, God, that you are bigger than any virus, God. You have more power than anything, Lord, in this universe. And God, we just pray that you would... Be with those that are dealing with the virus. God, we pray that you just heal their bodies, Lord, and uh, just be with them, wrap them in your arms, Lord, and give them grace and mercy. Lord, give them what they stand in need of. We pray for those families, Lord, that has lost loved ones, Lord, this ST's family. God, I pray that you just wrap them in your grace, and God, give them understanding, God, and comfort, Lord. The Bible says you're a God of all comfort, God, and right now that family needs you, Lord, more than ever. We just pray that you wrap them in your arms. God, we pray for those that, that are at school. God, we just pray for our teachers. We pray for our students. Pray that you keep them safe, God. And, Lord, just pray that you continue to, to, to look after them. God, we just pray for our country, God. We pray that you would touch our country, God. That, Lord, you touch the heart of our country, God, to the soul of our country. Lord, show your love, Lord, through your people in this country. Lord, that they might turn and, Lord, to uh, be repent and Lord just give their heart to you Lord that this country would turn unto you Lord like it once was God I pray for our president God I pray that you just give him the discernment and the wisdom and the understanding Lord to lead us in the way that you'd have us to go and Lord not the way that he wants it to go God we just we know that you'll do that God if we ask and God we ask that today God we pray Lord for our church God I pray for the church as a whole as a body of believers God that you'd strengthen us God that you'd make us what you'd have us to be but Lord I pray pray especially, Lord, for this church, God, I pray that, you, Lord, we'd always be found doing what you'd have us to do. God, I just pray that you would just continue to grow us, God. I pray that you grow us in spirit and in truth more than anything. But, God, we also pray for those that may be in this community, that, Lord, that need to be a part of this love, Lord, that we have here. And we just pray that you just watch after us, and, Lord, just be what, let us be what you would have us to be. God, I need your Holy Spirit tonight, God, more than ever. I ask you, Lord, Lord, to give me the understanding, give me the right spirit, Lord, give me the, the words to say that you've, uh, let me remember everything that I've studied, God, Lord, that what I say tonight would be an honor unto you. God, Holy Spirit, I need you to just take over this service, lead God and direct us, and we thank you for Jesus, Lord, we thank you that he died on the cross, we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, Jude, the book of Jude, we're going to be back there tonight, we've been slowly working our way through these verses, uh, only 25 verses in the book of Jude. And we haven't made it real far yet, but we're, we're going uh, at a snail's pace, but we're getting there. Tonight we're going to be in verse number 7. We covered the first few verses and we understood and learned that the main theme of Jude's letter was that we would contend for the faith, that we would know what the Bible says, that we would stand on the principles of the Bible, and that we would 
defend the Bible and defend the faith and the doctrines that we uh, have learned and what, what the doctrines that the Bible teaches us. It says it's been delivered once and for all unto us. That means this, this book is complete. This book is, is fully completed and it's all we need to be equipped. It's all we need to, to, to fight the, fi the battles that we fight each day. This book is all we need and we're thankful for that. And what he, was, what he was warning his readers about was these false teachers that had come into the church. And we had talked about them and what they were doing. They were Gnostic in their teachings. They believed different things, but he said they also were ungodly. They turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, means that they gave them, they took the grace of God and said it gave them a license to sin. And we know that that does not, Give, grace does not give us a license to sin. It gives us a reason not to sin. Amen. It tells us why we shouldn't sin because of what God has done. And said so they also denied the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Then he began to give us Old Testament examples. Old Testament examples of what, examples of apostasy, of how they, these people that had fallen away. And I want you to see, we talked about two of them last week. The first was the Israelites. Just real quick recap, and we talked about the Israelites and, their, and the, their example of apostasy was their unbelief to enter into the promised land. They, Jude tells of what they, how they fell away and the judgment that was put upon them for their falling away. They did not believe to enter into the promised land. They, God said, listen, all you have to do is move in. All you have to do is possess it. It's yours. I've given it to you. But they did not trust God in all that they had done, all that God had done for them already. And, and when they got to the borders of the promised land, they said, oh, I just don't think we can make it. They listened to these ten spies that came back. There were twelve that went in. Ten came back with an evil report. that says, we can't overtake it. We can't move in. We can't get the victory. But Joshua and Caleb said, oh, yes, we can. God said we can, so we can move in. But they listened to the wrong voices. Listen, the whole precept of Jews letter here is for us to listen to the right voices there are still voices in this day and time that if we'll listen to the wrong voices they'll re lead us in the wrong way these people listen to the wrong voices they listen to those uh, voices of dissent that said no we can't move in and because of that their judgment was physical death in the wilderness God said because you did not believe and you would not enter in you will die in the wilderness we know for 40 years they wandered and they died. All of that generation died in the wilderness. That was their judgment. Now, we talked about last week that those people were saved. They came out. I discussed that. If you need a review on that, you go back and watch last week's video. They were saved. They did not lose their salvation, but they lost their physical life. Then we moved on and talked about the falling angels. And uh, their, their sin or their uh, sin of apostasy was the sin of pride and immorality. They followed Satan as he began to rebel against God in heaven and they followed him and they were cast down out of heaven because of their sin. Not only did they fall out of heaven, but when they got here on earth, they began to do immoral acts to try to thwart the bloodline of Jesus to come through. They committed immorality with uh, women here on earth and because of that, their judgment was they were reserved an everlasting change. Right now, they are in the worst part of hell going through that judgment for the sin that they committed. Tonight, we're going to look at the third example <clears throat> and try to move forward unto the next verse, if we can get there. But tonight, we're going to look at lost people. These are people that are secular people, uh, unsaved people, and the falling away of this two cities in Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me read it to you real quick, the verses. I'm going to read 7, 8, and 9. The verse number 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now we're going to look tonight at this verse number 7, really going to focus on it, and we're going to look at the 
this last example of Old Testament apostasy, and it is Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to look at their sin, what their sin was, what the judgment that God sent upon for their sin, and the truth that we are to learn from this sin, and how we are to apply it to our lives. Now, I want you to know that we, we, we can really look at verse number 7 here tonight, and we can apply this in this day and time more than probably any other example that he gives us. We, we're going to see that there are some things that are very mirroring of what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, what's happening in our day and time, in our culture that we live in. We're going to see that there is still consequence to that sin today. But I want us to remember that we need to remember the reason that Jude was writing. This is important for us to apply this to our day and time. Why was he writing? What was the purpose for him writing? To warn against false teachers and how they deceive the faithful, right? In each example, uh, Jude gives these people that these, he says in each example, they were people that led people astray. Those, Those ten spies led those children of Israel into unbelief. Those fallen angels, they led. They were led by Satan into a fall. Uh, they, they fell and they rebelled against God. Tonight we're going to see the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were being led astray by these who would count or all they cared about, those in Sodom and Gomorrah, all they cared about was the pleasure and pleasing of themselves. They wanted to please their flesh. They wanted to please themselves. They did not care about anything else. Would you agree with me today? that there is a lost and a dying world that is only living to please themselves today. They are living with no other option or no other desire except to do what feels good to me. And if it feels good, I'm okay to do it. And I'm going to tell you, if they'll live their life that way, the rest of their life they'll, live that, they'll run that road all the way to hell. The Bible says that we are to acknowledge God and to know Him personally. These people did not know him. But before we get into this tonight, and listen, we all know, I don't have to go into great detail. I'm going to get into it here in just a minute. But just off the top of your head, when I say Sodom and Gomorrah, you know exactly what their sin was. We understand that. If you've been in in, in church very much at all, you understand that they were caught up in a sin of immorality as well. Sexual immorality, sexual perversion, things that went against nature. And, uh, we, if we do this now, we understand that. And any time you teach on this, and let me say this, I don't think the church teaches enough on this. I don't think the church preaches enough about things of this nature. This is one of those topics that we just like to stay away from because it's so, so controversial. But I'm here to tell you that we need to be preaching the truth and what the truth is and what the Bible says about that sin tonight. We're going to do that tonight, and we're going to do it in a loving spirit, but we're going to stand boldly on the truth of God's Word. Listen, I don't know anything else to do but to stand on what this book says. It's not about what I think. It's not about what society says. It's about, to me, what this book says. And to me, for me, you may disagree. There may be somebody that watches this online that is going to really get upset with me tonight and disagree with me. But I'm basing my thoughts and I'm basing what I believe on what this book says. And if you you take offense to what I say, then we can just take it up with the book. Because I'm going to stand on what the book says. I'm not really worried about what society thinks. not worried about what anybody else thinks. I'm worried about what the Word of God says. What we need to do more in this day and time is forget about what everybody else says and listen to what thus saith the Lord. That's what we need. And that's what we're going to try to do tonight. But we are going to do it in the right spirit. We need to do it in a loving spirit, but we're going to stand on it. So what is, what is their sin? I'm, I'm going to just turn to some different verses. You can write these down. You don't have to turn your Bible. <coughs> Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49. Listen, this, this Ezekiel writes out here kind of what the sin of Sodom was. Verse number 49 says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, her pride. I bet y'all didn't think that was the first one that was coming, right? But Ezekiel said one of their sins was pride. Fullness of bread and an abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Now, that's what Ezekiel said about was part of their sin. I'm going to read you what Jude said was their sin. 
Jude says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh and set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So Ezekiel says part of their sin was pride. Part of their sin was fullness of bread. That means what? They had everything that they wanted. They had a fullness of bread. They, did, they weren't hungry. They had it all. And they also had idleness, abundance of idleness. Now, let me ask you a question tonight. In this verses of Scripture here in Ezekiel, does that remind you of anybody else? I'm talking about a country. Does that remind you of any country in this globe that we live on today? Does it remind you? One that's fullness of bread. One that has abundance of pride and one that has an abundance of idleness. Let me tell you, them three things right there get you in trouble quick. Amen? When you got all the time in the world and you ain't got nothing to do, you can get in trouble. When I was a little boy, I think one of the worst times I ever got in trouble was because I was bored and I didn't have nothing else to do. And I just had got a brand new BB gun, and I was outside, and it was one of them that you could pump up about five or six times, and man, it'd go, I mean, you could shoot anything. I didn't have anything to do, and I didn't have nothing to shoot. There weren't no birds flying. There wasn't anything to shoot, but they just so happened to be in our pump house, a beautiful window that was just the right height, that was just, I mean, it was gleaming. It, it was almost like it had a sign above me that said, shoot me. And because I was bored and because I didn't have nothing else to do, I sat there and I shot, and the first bullet I shot through it made a perfect little hole in it. And I thought, man, that's the coolest thing. And I just kept on shooting, kept on shooting. Because I was bored by when my daddy got home and saw that his window was shot out of his pump house, I got whooped pretty good, amen? But that happened because I had an abundance of idleness. I didn't have anything to do. I think my daddy learned that day, that boy don't need to be bored. He needs to work, amen? So he always kept me something to do after that. But listen, if you have an abundance of idleness, you'll find ways to get in trouble. You'll find ways to sin. Sodom found a way to sin through their immorality. But it said pride. But this, listen, what I'm saying, all that describes a country just like America. America's full of bread. Most people that you see have an abundance of things. They have abundance of, uh, of money. It's very few people do we know that are, <clears throat> that are struggling. Uh, uh, I'm talking about struggling. I know there's poor people in America, but if you ever go to a third world country on a mission trip, uh, somewhere you'll see poor. America ain't poor. There's no poor people in America like there is over there in one of those countries. We have a fullness of bread. Uh, and America is full of a bunch of prideful people. We feel like we, we got all that we need and we, we don't need anything else. That'll get us in trouble. <clears throat> and it also allowed Sodom to get in trouble. Uh, this also says that Sodom was... One of their sins was they were giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. All those things led to a, an ability for them to get into sexual sin. Now, listen. <clears throat> the book says they give themselves over to fornication. What is fornication? Fornication is any type of sexual act that is not contained inside the marriage covenant. Any kind of, listen, God created an intimate relationship for marriage for the good of the husband and the good of the wife so that they could leave and become one flesh. And listen, it is the most beautiful thing in the world. In that context, that intimate relationship that a, a husband and a wife has, there is nothing like it. I mean, it is just wonderful. But anything outside of that is fornication. And it is a sin according to the Bible. So he said they had caused them to do that, but it said they also had given themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. That means flesh of a different kind. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute, what that might mean, but it also means when God designed an intimate relationship, he designed it between who? Adam and Eve, a man and a woman. And when you go after anything different from that, is what he is describing here after strange flesh, a man and a man or a woman and a woman. It becomes an abomination to the Lord. We're talking about the sin of homosexuality. 
Now listen, anytime a preacher talks about that, anytime a teacher teaches about that, you get a lot of backlash. Even people come begin to hate on you or they have an abrasive reception of that and they say, oh, we just can't talk about that in this day and time. But listen, we need to talk about it. Amen. We need to realize and say what the Bible says about it. The Bible calls a homosexual relationship sin. But the reason why you get this, this bad reception when you talk about it is mainly because <clears throat> when I've ever heard it taught on, it's usually been two, t- two ways. It's either they come across when the person is preaching or teaching about it, they come across so hard and so hard lined against it that it causes such rejection from it. What I'm saying is, the Bible, I've heard preachers preach about the sin of homosexuality and say they ought to be drugged out and shot and killed and put to death and they'll try to bring up different things in the Bible that, that does those things. That God doesn't love homosexuals and things of that nature. But I'm here to tell you, that's not what the Bible says. Listen, God stands against it completely. But he also loves that person that is caught up in it. And the other way that people approach that they don't want to be very controversial in the way that they teach against it, so they make it okay. I've done a lot of research on this this week as I was preparing. And I know a lot of y'all probably, as I'm teaching this, you're, you're kind of uncomfortable there listening to it. Well, just think how uncomfortable I am up here teaching it. Amen. It's not a fun thing to teach. But I wanted to be prepared. So I went and done a lot of research, and you would not believe how many places that I found and how many things that I just listened to if somebody's. Uh, attitude toward this, and they just swept it under the rug and say, oh, no, God loves that, and God, it's okay with God, and God's not against homosexuality, God's not against, that is a complete lie. That's the other way. Amen. That's the one way. One way it'll be so, so far to the right, and the other way it'll be so far to the left. Both of them are wrong, amen? God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner, Amen. He hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. Neither one of those are right. So what's the right way to teach upon? It's to tell the truth, to tell the truth of what God says. God says, I, the sin of homosexuality is an abomination unto me, but that person that's caught up in it, I love with an undying love, and I want to save them out of that. So that's what we're going to try to do tonight. You say, well, why are you even talking about this? Because, folks, this is, Folks that we know are dealing with this. Listen, there's, a, there's probably somebody in all of our families that deals with this. And if there's not somebody in your family that deals with this, there's some, probably somebody on your job that deals with this. If there's not somebody on your job that deals with this, you probably got a friend that's dealing with this. And there might be even somebody in our midst. And I'm not just saying in this room. I'm talking about somebody that's listening or somebody that may be a part of our church that's being tempted by this. I thought I heard y'all gasp right there. Listen, if you don't think for one minute that our teenagers are not being bombarded by this, you're fooling yourself. They are being tempted by this. This is being thrown in their face on a daily basis. It is being thrown in their face to accept as right and good and wholesome. And the Bible just doesn't agree with that. The Bible says this is not right. So we need to teach them Uh, exactly what the Bible says and what the response is to be. I want to see this. I want to to teach you on this tonight, and I want to teach it in the right way. But I want you to see what the Bible says about. So what does the Bible say about? Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13 says this. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Do you know what the word abomination means? An abomination means a disgusting thing, wickedness. This is what the Bible says, that God sees the sin of homosexuality as an abomination. It's disgusting. It is wickedness in the sight of God. It is an abomination to God. How does the Bible take, what does the Bible say that we are to do when we are confronted with that? As far as being tempted by that, young people, if you're listening to me tonight, if you're being tempted or being pressured to do these things, what does the Bible say that we ought to do with that? 2 Timothy chapter 22 says, flee youthful lust. Best thing you can do 
with it is to get away from it and get around somebody that is good. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter number 1, verse number 26, it says this, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. <clears throat> or excuse me, let me go to verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause... God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use of that which is against nature. He's saying it is disgraceful. That word vile affection, vile means disgraceful in the passions that it's going. That's how God feels about it. It's disgusting to him. That relationship, that is not why, that is not the relationship that God created and God ordained for mankind to enter into. And I've heard this, and this is what a lot of people say. Well, why, why is it so? Why is it such a big deal to the church? It's not hurting anybody. I'm doing it on myself. Listen, it's hurting you. You just don't know it. Those that are caught up in it, it is hurting you. But not only that, why is it such a big deal? Because God, one of the greatest things that God ever ordained is the relationship between a man and a woman. And what did he create that for? For them to enjoy one another, but also for what? Procreation. To multiply, to be fruitful, and populate the earth. And he, he wants that, and it's very, very important to God for us to do it in his way. Now, that's how God feels about the sin. But how does God feel about that person that may be caught up in that sin, or that person that is dealing with that temptation? What does God say about them? Does God say, oh, they ought, they ought to be just cast out. I don't want nothing to do with them. That ain't what my Bible says. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know who Christ died for? Sinners. You know who that, what that means? Anybody that has ever sinned of any kind. Christ died for sinners. He loves the sinner. He loves that person that is caught up in this kind of immorality, in this kind of sexual perversion. Listen, what we often do, what often happens in the church is homosexuality gets brought up to this big, it's the most vilest sin a person could ever commit. And then we leave these other sins alone like lying, gossiping, envying, covetousness. We leave all those alone. We won't talk about them, but we'll talk about homosexuality. But you know what God thinks about these sins? They're not like this. They're like this. They're the same to God. You know what? God died for that person that is caught up in that immorality just the same as he died for that person that's caught up in gossip, that's caught up in covetousness, that's caught up in all of those things. There is no, there's no difference in it with God. He loves that sinner, and he sent his son to die for them. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He also says this in the book of 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 2, that God is not slack concerning His promise. The Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everyone, even those caught up in those immorality, in the immorality and those sexual perversion. God wants them to come out of that because he died for them. Romans. I'm going to go back to the book of Romans, chapter number 32. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm not going to go right there right now. I'm going to leave that for, mo for just a moment. But listen, in other words, this is what the, all the, I said all that to say this. God despises the sin, but God loves that sinner. Did you know God loved the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, even though he was so disgusted by what was going on there that he wanted to save them, that he, he wanted, and listen, even Abraham tried to get God to save them. This is what God said. Let, let's go look at it real quick. If you want to turn, you can turn to uh, Genesis chapter 9. If we just, excuse me, Genesis chapter 19. If we back up into verse... Eight, or chapter 18, this is what happened. God saw all that was going on in Solomon and Gomorrah. He saw the sexual perversion. He saw 
the, the homosexual acts. He saw all of that taking place. And God says, that's come before me, and it's disgusting, it's an abomination, I'm going to destroy it. But old Abraham lifted his eyes up, and he looked down there, and he said, God, he said, God, would you destroy them all? Would they be 50 that would be in there that would be good? He said, would you, would you, would you spare them if they'd be 50? Oh, would you spare them? You know what God said? He, he said, Abraham, yes, I would. If there's 50 there, I'll spare them. I'll, I'll, I'll have mercy. I'll show my grace. But you know what? He looked in there, and they wasn't 50. But Abraham said, oh, God, but if there's 45, would you spare them for 45? And God said, yeah, I would. And he looked, and they wasn't 45. And Abraham said, oh, God. Would you spare them if there's just 30 of them there? 35 or 30? And he said, yeah, I would. Abraham began to count down, and every time God looked in those cities, he could not find that righteous person but one. He said, would you spare it if there's just one? He said, yeah, I would. But listen, this is what God was saying. God knew their hearts as well. Listen, God knew the hearts of those people. If they were 50, it's not that there weren't anybody there that was other than Lot. Lot, the Bible says, was a righteous man. Amen? And he pulled him out of there. But this is what he was saying. He was looking at their heart. And not only was there not anybody righteous there like that, but there was nobody that would turn. The Bible says in Jude chapter number, Jude chapter 1 verse 7, what we just, he says they were giving themselves over. You know what that means? It means they were completely indulged in it. They had given themselves to it, and they wouldn't turn him back. That's why God would have said, I got to, the, to wipe them out. But, listen, Abraham pleaded. Abraham pleaded for Lot to come. And this, those two, you remember those two angels that came and, and got with Abraham and ate with Abraham, and Abraham communed with them? When they left, they said, we've got to go down to, to Sodom. We've got to go down there. There's a man down there we need to go see. They walked up, and old Lot was sitting right at the gate. He was sitting at the gate, and when they came in, they said, hey, Lot, Lot just recognized, didn't know who they was, and they said, what y'all doing here tonight? And they said, well, we just come to visit. We're going to try to find us a place to stay. Lot said, oh, you don't have to do that. You can come stay at my house. But they said, oh, no, we're going to go look around the city. We've got to inspect some things. We're going to go look. And he said, we'll find a place to stay somewhere else. And Lot said, oh, I wish you'd just stay. They said, oh, no, we'll, we'll find something. If we don't find anything, we're just going to sleep in the city square. Well, they didn't find anywhere to stay. Those two angels came. And when Lot saw them out in the city square, he went and said, you got to come to my house and stay. This is not a place for you to stay at night. You come to my house and stay. They brought those two angels into his house. And not long after that, the men and all, it says all the men of Sodom came to knock on that door. They said, give me those men that came to stay with you so that we may know them. Now listen, they didn't want to just get, they didn't want to talk to them. They didn't want to get to know them personally. They wanted to get them to know them intimately. They wanted to bring them out, and they wanted to actually, if I can say this word that, and it not be too offensive, they wanted to rape those men. Abraham would not allow that, I mean, excuse me, Lot would not allow that to happen. Lot would not allow that to happen. He got those men out, and those men told Lot, he said, listen, at the crack of dawn, you get your family, you go look up, your brother-in-law, you got son-in-law, he says, you go get them. You go tell them it's time to get out. You got daughters, you go get them daughters. It's time to get out. If you got a wife, you go get your wife. And at the crack of dawn, you get out of this place because God's about to show his wrath. God's about to wipe them off the face of the map because they had given themselves over to fornication. What's the point I'm trying to make there? The point I'm trying to make, God is a graceful God. God is a God of mercy. God wants to save those old those out of that sin. But listen, they got to be willing to give themselves back to God. Those, those folks that see, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah did not. They were given over. They had given themselves to fully indulge over and over again. And because of that, God said, I'm going to rain my wrath down. They have fallen so far away. The Bible says that they, he rained down fire and brimstone. And those cities were destroyed. I found out something very interesting about that. They were burned with fire. Look, this is what it says in the book of, uh, of Jude. It says, 
after they had given themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, for our example, not to do what they did, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Not only did they, they were destroyed by fire, but they're also going to be judged through eternal fire. All those that die not saved, not knowing Jesus Christ, they'll also experience that same judgment. But listen, I found out a really neat thing about Sodom and Gomorrah, where they were situated in Sodom and Gomorrah. They were these great big tar pits in that area. I'm talking about these big pits, and what do you say, what's a tar pit? Anybody ever seen a tar pit? Y'all know what a tar pit is? I had never seen one around here, but what it was was it was a great, there was so much actually crude oil, just the, the things that we would make our gasoline out of now. It was so much of it in that area that it would just bubble up out of the ground and make a big old pit of oil, and they called it a tar pit, and it would bubble. What happens when you get oil and you put fire to it? Son, it burns up, doesn't it? When God rained that fire and brimstone out of heaven, it also hit on there. And you, do, you know that's why we've never found anywhere where they find, they know where it's at, but there's no sign of it because they have been burned with eternal fire. Listen, <clears throat> God despises the sin, but he loves that sinner. He wants to save that person out. So when we talk to somebody, when we confront those, and when we are confronting, we will be confronted by this type of thing. How do we respond to them? How do we respond? And how do we tell them about the goodness of God, how God loves them, how God does not want them to, to take part in those sinful relationships? And how do we portray and how do we share the love of God with them? First thing we've got to do is realize and tell them and let them realize how much God loves them and how much and what all that God did to save them out of those deadly sins. But I found something that was pretty neat. The problem that we run into when we, when we talk to people caught up in this type of sin is this. And i, I got to give credit where credit is due. Great Bible teacher, Robbie Zacharias. Some of y'all ever heard of him? Know him. Just passed away not too long ago. Cancer, I believe, is what he had. Just passed away. He's in heaven right now. But I, I saw a clip. That he, somebody proposed this question to him in, in a in a forum he was doing, he was answering questions. And this is what he said. He said, before I answer your question, he said, Do, can I ask you a question? And the, the person said, yeah. And he said, this is the problem we have. He said, there's a sociological problem when you talk to somebody about that. And he said, listen, he said, there's three different cultures that he knows of that has existed. He said, there's a culture called a theonomous, theonomous culture, which means... God, Theo, is God. Anonymous means law. A theonymous culture is a God. It's, it's, it's a culture driven by God's laws. God's laws are written so much upon our heart that we follow what God's law says. Now, there was a day, there was a day in time where this country was founded upon those type of, that type of culture. The founding fathers, he said, this is what... Ravi Zacharias said, he said, the founding fathers had so much of God's law and God's word written in their heart. When they set up this nation, they set it up on the principles of godly nation. And he said, so we allow God to say what is right and what is wrong. He says, do we live in that kind of culture now? That person said, oh, no, that ain't the kind of culture we live in. And we don't. Listen, we, we, we long past that. This country does not operate like that anymore, but it did at one time. So he said, all right, we don't operate there. He said, the next thing is there is a heteroautonomous law. That means law, a different law. And what that hetero means, different, anonymous law, a different law. He said, so it's not God's writing on the law, it's a different law. And what, that, what he went on to say was, that's kind of like the law that Islam operates under. That's the law that communism operates under. That's the law that like a Marxist, what the Nazis used to be uh, uh, or, or the communists operate under. It is 
there is a few people here at the top, they decide all the laws and they give them to all the other people and they have to follow them. It's just a few people that decide a kind of a dictatorship of law and the rest of them have to, to follow those laws. He says, is that the kind of culture that we live in now? And that person, no, we don't live in that culture. And we don't want that. He said, we don't want one person to make all the law and we have to you know, follow. He said, well, the only other one I know of is an autonomous culture. Y'all heard that, that word a lot lately, autonomous. Those autonomous zones that's been set up all over the world. You know what that means? Self-law. Yeah. Autonomous means self-law. Yeah. You know when they set that up up there in, in Seattle and all, they said, we're going to make our law. We're not going to uh, abide by the United States laws. We're going to do what we want to do. It's self-law. So every person is what he said. He said each person dictates what we believe as ourself. Now listen. He asked a person, he said, is that the kind of culture that we live under? He said, oh, yeah, that's, that's the kind of culture we live under. This is where Ravi Zachariah said the problem came from. He said this was, if we are going to live in that kind of culture, then you dictate for yourself what you believe, but I can dictate for myself what I believe. He said, I'm going to ask you a question, but I want you to make sure you do something. He says, when I tell you where I stand, I don't want you to swap to a heteros heterotonomous law. He said, the problem that we have when we talk to people about this is they want to say, well, I want to be homosexual. I want to do what I want to do. And then when you say, well, I don't agree with that according to God's law, they say, well, you can't do that. And you, I want to make, I, you, I want to tell you what you can believe and what you can't. He said, listen, that's the problem. Ravi Zacharias said, that when he would uh, disagree with someone, they would want to swap around and say, well, you can't disagree with me. You've got agree, you to agree with what I say. You can't disagree. This is the thing. we got to realize and we must understand that we can disagree with things that go against this Bible and say, listen, I may disagree. That don't mean I don't love you. That don't mean I don't care for you. That does not mean I do not want you to do these things. But listen, I can disagree with you and still be correct. And the problem, he was saying the problem we have is, and it is the problem. They want, the, the culture that we live in today wants you to agree and say, it's okay for me to do that. But God's law says we cannot do that. We cannot do that. We must stand. If we're going to be Christian, if we're going to follow these laws that's written in God's word, we've got to say, I can't accept it. Now, I can love you. I can pray for you, and I can help you through this, but I cannot accept it as right because the Bible teaches it's wrong. Now, listen. Golly, I'm out of time. Why, why did I tell you all this? Because I'm trying to tell you how we need to apply this. This was written for our example, right? Jews wrote this for us. Those that will be living in the last time. He knew we, will, we would uh, di different those, those type of things. And this is the truth. I heard another commentator say this, that, and it's sad. But today's time, you, the United States has become a modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's sad to say, but it's true. And I'm not just talking about homosexuality. I'm talking about all kinds of sexual perversion. It's all this, this country operates on. So what... Are we going to do about it? We've got to proclaim the truth. That's why Jude said you've got to contend for the faith. We've got to tell the truth, but we've got to tell it in love. We've got to tell them how much Jesus loves them and how much he died for them. I'm talking about for those that are caught up in any type of sin. I'm not just talking about homosexual sin. I'm not just talking about sexual perversion. I'm talking about anybody that's caught up in any type of sin. We must convey it with the love of Christ, as, love, as Christ did. Listen, this is the thing about Jesus that I always thought was striking. Jesus loved every sinner that he ever came in contact with. But when he saved that sinner out of that sin, he says, go and sin no more. Amen. And that's what we got to say as well. Listen, you can, you, you can come out, you can be saved, but you can't continue on in the sin. The one thing about Jesus is he never allowed anybody to stay the way that they were. He said, I want to change you, and I want to change you for good. I want you to come out of where you've been, and I want you to live the right on the, on the straight and the narrow, and that's what we have to do today. 
But listen, this is the thing. If we're not careful, Sodom and Gomorrah, because of their sin, suffered the judgment of God. And if you don't believe that we're suffering a little bit of judgment for some things that, that Christians has allowed to happen in this country, then you're fooling yourself. We're experiencing some of that right now. And you know why? Because we have not contended for the faith. Because we have not, not stood up as Christians and said that's not correct for God's word. That's not according to God's word. No. When they tried to take prayer out of the school, all the Christians would have had to done was stand up and say, no, you can't do that. But we didn't. When they passed same-sex marriage, we had to just stand up and say, no, that's not right according to God's law. And you say, well, what, why? somebody would, may say this, well, why is it God's law? Well, how do we get our laws? How do we get our moral law? Where do we find our moral How do we know that murder is wrong? From the word of God. Thou shalt not kill. How do we know stealing is not wrong? Thou shalt not steal. It all comes from the word of God. That's where the, our laws come from. So we have, to, we have to stand for it. We have to contend for it. Or they'll suffer the eternal fire that Jude is talking about. So contend for the faith. <coughs> I'm going to get back to this and I'm done. I didn't even get through this verse. I can't believe it. I was going to do about three verses tonight and I didn't get there. I promise I'll do more than one verse next week. But listen, the whole point of this is what? These three examples was what? Jude was giving us three examples and he's showing, and I haven't read this anywhere else. This is just what the Lord has shown me. But what Jude is showing us is in all three of these examples, somebody led people away. We need to be careful about what we allow to lead us. We need to always allow this word of God to lead us. We need to allow the right voices to lead us. We need to allow the truth to lead us. But we need to be careful about what we allow to lead us. And listen, we need to teach our children, <clears throat> you've got to listen to the right voices. There's, there's voices out there that's going to lead them. They want to put pressure on them to accept things that are, not, that are not accepted. But they are all led by false leaders. And we need to be careful and make sure that we're being led, not by wrong voices, and not by wrong teachers or false teachers, but by the right teachers. And listen, if, if what, you're, what you're allowing to lead your life, if it lines up with this right, you're a okay. Amen. This thing will lead you in the right way every single time. But you know what you got to do? What we got to do? What we have a responsibility to do? To know what this says and follow it each and every day. Now, listen, are we going to fail? You better believe we're going to fail. We're not going to do things right all the time. But listen, when you're walking with this right here in your heart, when you're learning and you're living by this right here, when you do mess up, you know what this right here would do? What did your mama used to do to you when you messed up? <coughs> did your mama ever smack you sometimes when you messed up? They, you can't do that nowadays. Back in the day, when we used to ride, when I used to be going down the road, I'd be riding in the back seat, and if I was acting up, my mama would turn around and she'd whack. She'd smack me real good. When you mess up, and you got sin, and you leave this, and this is here, this, this is what it'll do. It'll smack that old heart. And it'll show you, hey, that's wrong. That's wrong. You got to get that right. That's wrong. You got to get that right. It'll do that. And listen, but when we don't have that, it just, we'll, we'll just keep on going and run wild. That's why we need to know it. That's why we need to contend for it. That's why we need to do it. Jude was just giving us three Old Testament examples of those things. And we're going to see some more examples coming up uh, about what he was doing. But we need to make sure. But listen, if you're watching this tonight, I know all of you here have heard everything I said tonight. But listen, if you're watching tonight online, and you may be struggling with what I talked about tonight, the sin of homosexuality or pressures to do those things, I want you to know something tonight. God loves you. And God's word says it is wrong. But God says that he loves you so much that he wants to help you through those things. And listen, he can. The Bible says that who the Son has set free is free indeed. He can show you the truth and he can set you free by the truth if you'll accept it tonight and believe it. 
And I promise you, you'll never be sorry for doing that. Uh, I just wanted to say that tonight from the bottom of my heart. But I want you to know something. We love you, and the Lord loves you. And uh, it's not right, but God can change any heart at any time. Amen. All right, next week, church, I want you to do this. Go look, Mr. Cole. You got that where you can pull that up to the next couple of verses? Uh, pull up verse 9. All right. We got, we got a very interesting verse right here. She did go home and do a little bit of research this week. I'm not telling you to study it out so you can teach the, the lesson. Go home and study verse 9. This is, a, this is one that, that's a little different right here. This, is, this tells about a, a battle that's taking place between an archangel, Michael the archangel, and against Satan over the body of Moses. And this is, this is something that, that's very... It's going to be very interesting. We'll go through these two verses next week. But you go home and you look over that. Read into it. Do a little bit of research on it. And that way you'll have a little bit of knowledge about what we're going to be talking about next week. But uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to you. Something that there's nowhere else in the Bible. You cannot find this in the Bible. But uh, you'll, find, you'll do a little research. You'll know what, it, what it's talking about. And we'll be able to, to do it next week. But listen, I want to tell you thank you for being here. Does anybody have any, anything you want to add? Anything you want to question? Any? Anything you, you need to say tonight before we dismiss? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Stand up. But this is the thing. Would we stand for that that one though? There, there's things that we'll allow to go on and we won't open our mouth about. But now if you was beating her and she come she walked up to church with bruise on her. They'd be some men come see you. They would. I, I, I'm but listen, I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to make a point. <laughs> no, we 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 know we know she's not doing it. But what I'm saying is, there's certain things that we'll stand up and say, "No, you can't do that." But we'll let other things go, and and say, "No, I'm not going to get involved in that. I just don't want to. I don't want to do that." But listen, we have to we have to stand. That's what that's what Jude is telling us. Contend. Stand for it. Stand for what is right. There's an old song, old country song, that Aaron Tippin used to sing. What did he say? Y'all know what it says? Come on. There you go. You got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. That's the truth. Listen, we, we got to stand for the word of God. As Christians, we got to stand for it. Or we'll fall for anything that comes by. And that's what's happening. But you're right, brother. We, we're, we're to that place in, in, this, in this culture in this society now, where we're just like, oh. I
they don't show it on the issue of notice, but it would create any kind of deal that would then obligate you to the crookedness and corruption of our government. Money, you know, we're on a losing battle. Is that the way it's been in the last day? But it's because, but we, it's because we've allowed so many voices to stand in opposition of what we stand for. Mm -hmm. Listen, how many voices did it take to get prayer took out of school? One. Yeah, one. How many voices would it have took to get kept it in school? Two, maybe three. I mean, you just gotta outvote them, right? But we didn't stand. But yeah. But you, you, you see what I'm saying? Uh, it was just it only took one to say, "Hey, I don't want it." But where was all the voices say, "Yeah, we do want it." It's, and, and listen. Exactly. That's what I'm. That's what we're talking about. That's exactly what we're talking about. Right. Absolutely. Uh, it reminds me, as we was talking about this, it reminds me of Ezekiel 22. What does it say? And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me in the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. That's sad. God's looking for some folks to stand in the gap, even today. You might say, well, it's, done, it's gotten so far. What are we standing for? I mean, we're not going to make any difference. Yeah, we do. We can make a difference. We can make a difference for some. We can make a difference. If we can reach one soul, if we can reach one person and draw them out of a life of sin and into a life of, of freedom in the goodness and the righteousness of God, then we've done something. We've stood for something. Then we've, we, we've accomplished what God has wanted us to do. And this is the thing. You'll be surprised if you'll just start standing just how much God will use you and just how much God good God will do through you. you. You may not even know it. You may not ever know it till you get to heaven. But could you imagine when you get to heaven thinking, well, I didn't do nothing while I was down here. And then God begins to show you all the things that he used you for while you're here. What a blessing that'll be. All them rewards that you'll, that you'll get when you're there. So listen, that's, that's exactly right. We gotta stand and we gotta continue to push. That's all, listen, all I'm trying to do here is encourage us. I know this has been a hard study. It's been a hard study to teach, but I'm thinking, I think you're kind of getting what I'm looking for now, just for us to stand, just for us to stand on the Word of God, for the Word of God, and, and do it in the right way, in the right spirit, in the spirit of love, because that's what God taught us to do. It's what He commands us to do, and that's what we want to do, and I appreciate you, church, so very much. Anything else? He did. Good job. But it's, it's what you've done in the past that made a difference. Absolutely. And look at it. I told him he could be up here an hour and a half before that. Look, that's the seven, he done went overtime. Uh, 808. Hey, man, that's good. That's absolutely. That's good. Hey, listen, discipline has never hurt a child. I promise you. Look what he's done. <laughs> That's good. Boy, God's good. I appreciate that. I'm proud of you, Mason. Good job. <laughs> All right, anybody got anything else? It sure has been good to be in the Lord's house tonight. I love you, church. Love you from the bottom of my heart. We appreciate you so very much. And boy, we just had a sweet spirit here lately. And uh, I pray, I ask you to pray as we work up to, to Sunday that we'll have that same spirit again. Let God move and God transform us. God help us to reach this world. Uh, look, there's folks all over this community that we need to reach. There's folks all over the places where you work that we need to reach. 
There's folks all over in your friend, your circle of friends that we need to reach. And it's true for every one of us. There's people in our family that we need to reach. And that's what we want God to do. Transform us so we can help God, allow God to transform me. So you just continue to pray for that. Continue to pray for our schools and all the things that's been mentioned today. And uh, if you have any needs or anything, you just let me know tonight, okay? All right, let's stand on our feet. I love you, church. And uh, I don't even want to leave. Amen. It's been good. It's been good to be in the Lord's house today. We're going to be dismissing a word of prayer. Travis, would you dismiss us tonight? Could you pray for us? All right. Amen. Amen. Good job.